how widely applicable uh, this, uh, these kind of algorithms as well as this framework is for solving various uh, real world problems. So um, I'll jump into uh, the outline. So this particular topic called resource allocation algorithms, uh, firstly I'll define a very abstract setting called an allocation setting. Uh, the main idea or the high level idea is that you want to allocate resources to people or agents as, as you call them abstractly and you want to do it in a way which is uh, fair or efficient and these terms fair and efficient are pretty vague so we will have mathematical definitions of what it means to have an allocation which is fair. It's based on the idea that everybody should have a reasonable amount of items or objects and they should be happy with what they get. So this uh, may be important in various contexts where you want to allocate resources or bandwidth to different agents which could be robots or humans and you want to do it in a way so that you want to make everybody happy and not have this idea that somebody is much better off than a one particular person or agent. So I'll go over the basic allocation setting. So this setting concerns uh, three different, uh, this setting has three different important components. One is that it involves a set of agents. Normally the set of agents is denoted by set a capital N and there are N, small n different agents which are denot denoted from one to N. And you also have a set of items which are uh, denoted by capital O and we assume that there are small m different items uh, to be allocated among the agents. Another thing which is a bit abstract for now is that we have a preference profile which specifies for each agent i her preference over each subset of items. So this is the preference profile, this, this is a, denotes the preference of agent one, this denotes the preference of agent n, and this will denote some kind of preferences that agents have over different subsets of items. This could mean that one agent says that I prefer this set of items over another set of items, so this kind of information can be represented or stored by this preference function. One particular nice way of uh, representing preferences is via utility. So you could also have the same preferences encoded by utility function. So instead of having this particular symbol which captures preferences of agents, you could have a corresponding utility function ui for agent i. And this denotes or this is a function which maps each agent i's utility for each particular object. So this will become a bit clearer when I give you some examples as well as uh, a more concrete formulation of the setting. But the main thing to take away from uh, this slide is that an allocation setting involves a set of agents, a set of items, and each agent having some kind of preference or utility over these subsets of items. So this is the main idea of an allocation setting. And of course, we, are, uh, we want to find some desirable allocation. So an allocation X is a partitioning of the items among these sets. So XI denotes the allocation or the set of items given to agent I. X1 denotes the set of items given to agent 1. X2 denotes the set of items given to agent 2, and so on. And each of these XIs is a subset of the total set of items and we impose certain conditions on what kind of allocations we are looking at. One is that allocations should be disjoint which means that we are not going to share items, each agent is going to get her own item. Another assumption we have is that uh, the union of all the x size should be the total set of items. So Essentially, we are finding a partitioning of the items into different sets and each of these sets is disjoint from each other. So it's pairwise disjoint. So this is the kind of outcomes we are after. We have the set of items, we want to partition these items among the agents and each agent is going to get her corresponding set of items. And for each corresponding set of items, an agent derives some preference or utility or happiness 
from getting that particular subset of items. So this is the setting we are going to look at. Just a bit of more notation. So since I was talking about preferences, uh, when you have um, this particular symbol, it means that A is at least as preferred, uh, the set of items A is at least as preferred as set of items B by agent I. Um, you can also have strictly preferred, which means that set of items A is strictly more preferred than the set of items B by agent I. And finally, this symbol denotes indifference or um, basically agent I thinks that she gets the same utility or has the same preference for both set of items A and set of items B. So these are just a bit of notation to see how we reason about, how agents reason about uh, different bundles of items. So we immediately jump onto a very simple setting called additive utilities. And in additive utilities, the nice thing is that you do not have to express preferences over sets of items. Note that uh, uh, having preferences over sets of items is pretty expressive, but since we are interested in having compact representations or problems which can be represented compactly, Additive utilities can uh, express preferences in a very compact manner. In particular, each agent I has a utility function UI, which maps each item to a corresponding utility. So UI of small o will denote the utility agent I has for getting an item small o. And in particular, the utility that agent I has for a subset of items, which is big O prime, is simply the sum of the utilities that agent high has for all the items in uh, big O prime. So it's very easy to see that uh, what utility an agent is going to get when she gets a set of items. It's simply going to be the sum of the utilities she has for the respective items in that set. So let's just look at an example which will make things even clearer. So this is an allocation setting in which you have two agents, one and two. You have four items, O1, O2, O3, and O4. And each agent, one and two, has corresponding utilities for each of the items. So agent one thinks that she is going to get utility six when she gets item O1. She thinks that she's going to get utility three when she gets item O2. She gets utility two when she gets item O3 and so on. And this can be captured uh, in a more formal way in this particular row. And you notice here that if we want to go back to our general way of expressing preferences, we say that utility of uh, having this particular set for agent one is more than utility of O2, O3. And this can be captured in this way as well. That O, agent one thinks that having the set which involves O1 and O2 is strictly better than having the set O2, O3. And why is that? What is the utility agent one gets for having O1 and O2? So it's a utility is six plus three and for uh, getting O2 and O3 is three plus two. So indeed, agent one thinks that she gets more utility by having this set rather than this set. So all the agents want to get as much utility as possible. Of course, each agent would rather have all the uh, items as possible, but we want to allocate the items in a fairer manner so that everybody thinks that it's a reasonable outcome. So we'll be after uh, allocations which are fair under additive utilities. So when we talk about fairness, uh, several approaches have been proposed in computer science and economics. And one particular very uh, desirable way of formalizing fairness is called envy freeness. So we say that an allocation X satisfies envy freeness if agent I thinks that her allocation XI is at least as preferred as another agent, uh, each other agent J's allocation. In particular, ui of xi is greater than or equal to ui of xa, xj. This means that agent i is not envious of agent j. Overall, we want that for each i and j, you have this condition that ui of xi is greater than or equal to ui of xj. 
This basically says that agent I thinks that her allocation, utility she has for her own allocation, is at least as much as the utility she has for another agent's allocation. So an allocation is going to be envy free if this condition is satisfied for each I and J, uh, which are both I and J are agents. So if this, this is satisfied for all I and J, the allocation satisfies any freeness. If this condition is not satisfied for some I and J, that means that some agent I is envious of agent J because agent I thinks that agent, she would rather have agent J's allocation. So is this definition clear? So this is the definition of envy freeness and let's just look at one particular example. This is an ex example where agent, R, agent 1 gets item O1, O2, and O3. So in, in total, she gets utility 6 plus 2 plus 3. Agent 2 just gets one particular item, which is item 4, O4. And she gets utility 3. Of course, agent 2 is going to be envious of agent 1 because agent 2 thinks that she would get more utility than she currently has if she gets agent 1's allocation. So that's why this particular allocation is not envy free. Another uh, fairness notion which is quite popular uh, in computational economics is called proportionality. And proportionality requires, uh, so this should not be J, it should be just I. So proportionality requires that agent I's utility for her own allocation should be at least as much as what utility she has for all the items divided by n. So this, is, this uh, corresponds <coughs> to the idea that if there are n agents, and each agent might expect that if there are n agents, then she should, and there is a total utility which she has of u i of capital O, then she should get at least one nth of that total utility. So it also captures a reasonable fairness uh, notion or an idea of uh, fairness. And again, in this example, what you see is that agent two does not think that this particular allocation X is proportional. And the reason is because agent two's total utility is four plus one plus two plus three. So total utility is 10. Agent two gets total utility, which is just three. And in order for proportionality to be satisfied, <coughs> agent two expects utility at least five, right? So whereas agent two, agent one thinks it's proportional, agent two thinks it's not proportional, and in order for an allocation to be proportional, every agent I should think that, the, that her particular allocation is giving it, giving her at least one tenth of the total utility she can get for all the items. So two nice notions uh, which we have now are envy freeness and proportionality. And one nice fact to know is that if an allocation is complete, which means that all items are allocated and the utilities are additive, in that case, uh, if an allocation is envy free, it is also proportional. In other words, uh, envy freeness is a stronger property than proportionality. Another way to think about it is that if an allocation is not proportional, then it's also not envy free. So if you would rather have an allocation satisfying a fairness property, uh, you would go for envy freeness because it's a stronger fairness property. So I'm just going to go over the proof uh, why an allocation which is envy free is also proportional. So the definition of envy freeness is that ui of xi is greater than or equal to ui of xj for all j. In that case, you have all these different inequalities which are present. If you just look at all these inequalities and you add them up, you get this particular inequality, which is on the left-hand side, you add n of these in inequalities, you get on the left-hand side, you add them up, and you get n times ui of xi. On the right-hand side, you simply add up all the uis for xj's, for all j's, which means that you basically add up the utilities agent <coughs> i has for all the items. So this particular thing is simply ui of o. And if you just take n from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, uh, you see 
that ui of xi is at least as much as ui of capital O divided by n. So this is a simple elegant proof why uh, envy freeness implies proportionality. So we would want to go for envy freeness if possible. The only issue with uh, these fairness notions is that uh, they may not exist in allocation which is either envy free or proportional. This would even become even more evident if you just had one item and both, of, both the agents are fighting over that item. But another extreme example is that you have two agents, both of them really have high utility for o item O1 and have much lower utility for item O2. And in this case, you cannot guarantee uh, the existence of a fair allocation. But of course, if you have more items, you might want to do it in some kind of balanced way. So one result in this uh, regard is that not only may a proportional or envy free allocation exist, but in fact, finding an allocation which is either proportional or envy free is also a hard problem. In particular, uh, this particular problem is NP complete which uh, if you have not covered uh, NP completeness before, is an informal way of saying that unless some strong hypothesis uh, holds, uh, there may not exist any polynomial time algorithm for solving this particular problem. So this is uh, a way of showing that certain problems may not admit or it's very challenging to find polynomial time algorithm for it. So the idea of uh, proving these kind of statements is that you start from a pr problem which is well known to be NP complete and you show that if the problem we are looking at, uh, we can solve that particular problem in polynomial time, then we can also solve a well known NP complete problem in polynomial time as well. So you've already covered uh, some reductions implicitly in the dynamic programming lecture where I said that if you have an algorithm to solve one particular problem, you can simply use the same algorithm to solve a slightly different variant of that problem by first changing one problem to another, <coughs> applying that algorithm for the, the latter problem, and using that solution to find the solution for your original problem. So the same kind of idea can be applied here even if you do not have the background uh, of proving what NP completeness is or what a reduction is. So the idea is very simple. Uh, the idea is that we start from a problem which is well known to be NP complete. So we, in order to prove NP completeness, we start from a problem which is well known to be NP complete and we show that the problem which we are looking at, if that admits a polynomial time algorithm, then that would imply that the well known NP complete problem also admits a polynomial time algorithm. So this is a very nice thing to know and to apply. It may be the case that you have some favorite problem of yours and you're struggling with finding a polynomial time algorithm for it, but it might simply be the case that uh, you're trying to solve an NP-complete problem, and if it's an NP-complete problem, and uh, it's very unlikely that you have a polynomial time algorithm for it. And in case you do find a polynomial time algorithm for an NP-complete problem, uh, there are $1 million prizes for uh, these kind of problems. So it's less likely that you have a polynom polynomial time algorithm for an NP-complete problem. Or if you do, please let me know. <laughs> so uh, we're going to prove that uh, there exists, uh, checking whether there exists a uh, NV free or proportional allocation is NP complete. And in order to do so, we look at this particular problem, which we actually already looked at in, in our previous uh, lecture yesterday. It's a problem called integer partitioning. It's very similar to another problem which we looked at, which was balanced sets we looked at. So the problem is that you have a set of integers uh, from, there are m different integers, and the sum of the weights of those integers is 2w. So it comes up to be some even number. And the question is, does there exist a partition of these weights into two different sets that such that the sum of the weights in each of the set is exactly capital W? So is there a way to divide the weights in a way so that each of those sets has half the total weight. This problem is well known to be NP complete. Another side fact uh, to know is that although it, this problem is NP complete, it does admit a dynamic programming algorithm. 
Uh, and this can be solved by doing something very similar to what I taught yesterday uh, for a knapsack problem. So it's worth looking at this particular problem and seeing how this can be solved by dynamic programming. Of course, that dynamic programming algorithm is not going to give you a polynomial time algorithm to solve the problem. It's going to give you a problem, uh, an algorithm which is pseudo polynomial time, which means that it's polynomial as long as all the integers involved in this problem are small enough or they're constant. So why does this problem uh, relate so much to our given problem of finding or checking whether they exist in NB fewer proportion allocation? Well, the idea is very simple. The idea is that you take this problem and you reduce it to our, our problem in the following way. You imagine that there are two agents. There are, so there are M weights. You imagine that there are M different items and you imagine that each of those two agents has utilities which correspond to these weights. So for example, if there is an item O1, both of those agents think that they have utility W1 for that item. If there is an item w, weight W2, then there is a corresponding item O2, and both agents think that they have utility uh, which is equal to W2 for that item. And the only time a uh, proportional n free allocation exists is if it's a case that there exists a way of partitioning the weights in such a way so that both sets in the partition have the same weight. If one of those partition of items has a different weight, then that means that the other is going to have slightly less weight. In that case, the agent who gets that uh, set of items which has a weight less than capital W is going to be envious of the other agent. So by this kind of argument, we can say that there exists a proportion allocation if and only if there exists an integer partitioning of the integers corresponding to the weights so that each partition has total weight. So if we are able to find and uh, if we are able to check whether an NV free allocation exists, we know uh, if an uh, NV free or proportion allocation exists, we know that there is a way of solving this and there's a yes instance of this problem. If there is no uh, in fewer proportion allocation, then that means that there is no way to partition the problem, these weights in a way, so that each partition has weight capital W. So this shows that if you have a polynomial time algorithm for solving or f uh, checking whether there exists a proportion or free allocation, you can also solve the partition problem in polynomial time. So this is just one particular reduction. But the, this is a template for any other reduction you may uh, encounter. So if you're solving a, a very challenging problem, uh, one way to proving NP completeness is that you take an established NP complete problem and you show that if your problem which you're solving can be solved in polynomial time, then that established NP complete problem can also be solved in polynomial time. So this particular statement was proved by Demko and Hill in, in 1988 and just shows that there are lots of drawbacks of considering any freeness and proportionality. One which we saw in the previous slide is that an NV free proportion allocation may not exist. And now we know that actually finding such an allocation is also an intractable problem unless the weights are small. So in view of this scenario, uh, I'm going to weaken uh, the idea of NV free a bit. And I'm going to focus on a concept called EF1. So EF1 means that it's, it's, you can view it as a weakening of NV freeness. And it says that agent I is either, for each agent I and agent J, either agent I is not envious of agent J, or agent I is not going to be envious of J if some item from agent J's uh, bundle is removed from agent J's allocation. So, uh, if you look at our example, if O1 is given to agent 1, O2 is given to agent 2, agent 2 is going to be envious of agent 1, but it's not going to be so much envious, it, it will not be envious as long as one item is removed from agent 1's allocation. So what is nice about EF1 is that uh, if there may not exist an NV free allocation, there may exist an EF1 allocation. In fact, I'm going to prove that an EF1 allocation always exists, which was not the case for NV free allocations. And there exists a polynomial time algorithm to find an EF1 allocation as well, which is nice. 
So, in this particular case, uh, just to exemplify what EF1 means, in this particular case, agent 2 is of course envious of agent 2, but this allocation does satisfy EF1 because agent 2 can be consoled and said that as long as uh, let's say item O1 vanishes, then you will not be envious of agent two, uh, agent one. So it's a natural weakening of envy famous. So I'm going to go over an algorithm which was proposed in 2004 by Lipton and uh, his co-authors. And the idea of this allocation uh, algorithm is that you view uh, a graph based on this allocation. So whenever you have an allocation, uh, you view or imagine an envy graph of the agents. An envy graph simply means that agent 1 points to agent 2 if agent 1 envies agent 2, simply because agent 1 thinks that she would rather have agent 2's allocation. Agent 2 points to agent 3 because agent 2 thinks that she would rather have agent 3's allocation and so on. So what we do is we always have some allocations and we, have a we all can always have a corresponding envy graph of that allocation. And what we do is for any partial allocation, which means that uh, a partial allocation means that you may not have allocated all the items, you can have a corresponding uh, envy uh, graph. Of course, if there are no items, you have an empty graph and that particular graph has no cycle. Uh, and this particular algorithm is based on building up different allocations, looking at the corresponding graph, envy graph of that allocation, and uh, then using that envy graph in some way and then modifying the allocation. So let's just look at uh, a particular example. In this, this example, let's say we have an allocation. Uh, we have allocated some items among the agents. And based on this uh, partial allocation, you have this particular envy graph. In this graph, uh, what, there is an issue, which is that there is a cycle, right? So if you have a cycle, this is actually nice for us because this means that four would rather have three's allocation, three would rather have five's allocation, and five would rather have four's allocation. So whenever you have a cycle, you can simply implement an exchange of allocations in that cycle. So four simply gets the allocation of the person she envies, three gets the allocation of person she envies, and so on, but when you do that, the graph obviously changes, and the reason is because four no more envies three, because four now thinks that she has a better allocation than three. Three does not envy five, because she thinks she has a better allocation than five, and five does not envy four. So all these arrows have vanished. On the other hand, two was envying three, because two thought that three has a better allocation than two, this particular allocation has now gone to agent four, so in that case, two is now going to envy agent four. So whenever you have a cycle in the envy graph, you can uh, implement an exchange of the uh, items among the agents in the cycle. After that, what you notice is that the number of edges in an envy graph has reduced. So all the agents within a uh, envy uh, cycle certainly do not have any uh, edges in that cycle. As far as the other agents are concerned, they still have some edges, but those edges, the number of those edges is exactly the same. It has not increased. So whenever you implement an exchange of uh, items in a cycle, the number of edges strictly decreases. So this idea is nice because you're going to exploit it. So this is the formal uh, description of the algorithm. And the idea of this algorithm is that initialize, we firstly initialize an allocation which is the empty allocation, so no agent has any allocation. And what we do is, we will gradually look at O1, O2, O3, and we will continue allocating those items among the agents. When we allocate, given a partial allocation, when we allocate another item among the agents, it may cause some envy. And we have to reduce that envy in some way, so what happens is that Firstly, we start with an empty allocation. An empty allocation uh, does not have any cycle. So this is something which we will maintain that we will always get rid of any cycles that an envy graph may have. So initially, it does certainly does not have a cycle. So we construct a graph. Since we have allocated a new item, 
to, to an agent. So initially, the NV graph does not have a cycle, which means that at least one, since there is no cycle, at least one agent has no incoming edge. Because if every agent had an incoming edge, you would guarantee a cycle. So we know that at least one agent does not have an incoming edge. So we always guarantee the existence of some vertex i which has no incoming edge. For that particular uh, vertex or agent i, we give that agent the next item which has not been allocated. After we do that, it may cause some problems because now some agent might start envying agent i. But if that is the case, that means that we may have a cycle. But if there is a cycle, we can implement exchanges in a cycle to get rid of those cycles. And when we get rid of cycles, we only reduce the number of edges. And we can only do it finitely often until we get rid of the cycle and the graph is again acyclic. So the general idea of the algorithm is that you start with an empty allocation. You start allocating items O1, O2, O3, and so on to among the agents. Every time you give an additional item, it has to be given to an agent who does not have an incoming edge in the graph. And you know that such an agent always exists because you're always maintaining a graph which is without any cycle. The moment you give an item OI or OJ to agent I, it may lead to uh, creation of some cycle. But the moment you uh, have some cycle in the graph, you start ex doing these exchanges among the agents. And once you continue these exchanges, at some point, you converge because you've got rid of all the cycles in the graph. Once you've done that, you can continue allocating more items to the agents one by one. Yeah? Sorry. Agent can be envious of everyone. That's, that's fine. But uh, the issue is that uh, we have control over how to get rid of NV cycles. So it may be the case that if one agent is envying everyone, but as, as soon as you have the case that you have a cycle of envies, then you can simply uh, have an exchange. And if you do not have a cycle of envies, that means that some agent does not have an incoming edge. So you can always allocate an additional item to that particular agent. Yes, so whenever you have an uh, allocation and a corresponding graph which has a cycle, then you implement exchanges uh, in, among agents in that cycle. And as I argued here, so this is a nice example to show why this is the case. So you have this cycle, you implement exchanges in that cycle. When you do that, all these edges have gone away. For all the other agents, they, their edges between each other remain the same, but all these edges in a cycle, which were present in a cycle have gone away because four no more envies three, three no more envies five, five no more envies four. So this is EF1. EF1, yes. So uh, we always maintain the case that uh, you, uh, you satisfy, a partial allocation satisfies EF1 you cannot guarantee uh, that an allocation satisfies EF because, of course, if there is, let's say, only one item, you will always have the case that one agent points to another agent. And what's the proof for EF1? So this is, this is, uh, this is the, I don't have a formal proof, but I'm giving you an idea of how to go about it. So uh, we start with a graph which is empty. So that corresponds to an EF1 allocation, and empty allocation is EF1. Right. Um, when you have an empty graph or you have an acyclic graph, you know that at least one agent has no incoming edge. So you can easily give an item to that particular agent. If you give that item to that, that particular agent, of course, as long as there are um, edges in a graph, you have envy. But you do not have EF1 because we are always giving an additional item to the agent who has no incoming edge, which means that even if you, if you give that item to that agent, some people might envy that agent. But the moment you remove that uh, item from that agent, they will not envy that agent, which is, is the, exactly the requirement for EF1. Okay, 
So we're maintaining this invariant that you start with a graph which is acyclic, you additionally allocate an item uh, among the agents, uh, that might lead to some additional envy and it, it might actually uh, lead to a cycle, but that's good for us because we can re uh, remove those edges uh, in the cycle. So after doing that, uh, we always have EF1. Okay. And the reason why EF1 is maintained is because we always give it to that particular agent uh, who has no incoming edge. So even uh, that means that if you remove that item that you have newly given to that agent, uh, you can again uh, regain envy freeness. No, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, you simply cannot guarantee proportionality. And that can be uh, seen by just having two agents and one item, right? So you cannot guarantee. But what is nice is that envy freeness, EF1 allocation always exists and it can be found by this algorithm. So some overview of properties, um, EF implies proportionality, EF also implies EF1 fairness. EF and proportion allocation may not exist and in computation, computationally hard to compute. And EF and al allocation not only always exists, but can be computed in polynomial time. So I'm running short on time, but I would like to give one more setting and one more algorithm very quickly. Uh, and uh, it should be quite digestible because the ideas are very similar to this particular algorithm. So in this case, we're gonna talk about housing markets or allocation with endowments. And we will focus on the case where each agent is to be given exactly one item. So previously we had many items and an agent could possibly be given multiple items. In this case, each agent owns exactly one item is, and is going to be allocated exactly one item. So the idea is that everybody comes with their own item and you may want to reallocate the items in such a way which is desirable for different agents. So uh, this is an example of a housing market. Housing market has the same number of agents and items. Each agent uh, owns uh, item omega i, which is O. It's owned by agent i. Agents have strict preferences, so which means that agent, we ma make an assumption that agent one has, strictly prefers, most prefers one item, and then second most prefers the second item, and so on. and this is an example of how you can express these preferences. So here you have five agents, five items. This is exactly the same as before. But you have this additional information now that each agent also owns an item. So in this case, we make an assumption that agent I is going to own OI. So these are the preferences of agent one. We note here that we do not really need to worry about uh, actual utilities because all the information that we need is whether Agent one strictly prefers O2 over O1 or O1 over O2. So in this case, agent one thinks that O2 is the most preferred item, and then uh, O1 is strictly less preferred than O2. And agent one simply does not express any preferences over any items O3, O4, and O5. And the reason is that she may think that uh, she, since she owns O1, and since O1 is strictly more preferred more preferred than O3, O4, and O5, she would only be interested in allocations which either give her O1 or O2. So she would only make an exchange if she gets an item which is either her own item or an item which is strictly better or more preferred than her own item. She will never be, want to be part of an exchange where she comes uh, to the market with an item O1 and then ends up getting an, an item in exchange which is worse. So you do not want to have an exchange where you come with an item and you get something worse. So this property is, uh, I, which I informally mentioned is called individual rationality. I won't go over the formal definition, but the main idea is that when you come with an item, you want to go away with either the same item or an item which is strictly more preferred. So this is one property which we are after for all I, Agent I's allocation should be at least as good as her endowed uh, item. Another uh, property which is very strong is called core stability. And the idea is that there should not be any subset of agents S, 
subset of set of agents such that there exists an allocation Y which simply involves the endowments of the agents in capital S such that when you do this reallocation among these endowments, each agent in S gets her allocation which is better than her endowment, uh, better than the allocation. So the idea is that you'd never want to have an allocation where uh, you make an allocation based on the agent's endowments and preferences, but you have the case that some agents can think that instead of having this allocation, we would rather go on one side, do our own uh, reallocation and everybody is strictly better than what the system is uh, expressing or suggesting. You do not ever want to have that kind of uh, situation because that would mean that the allocation suggested by the system is unstable. So an allocation is score stable when you never have the case that a set of agents can use their endowments, do some reallocation among themselves and have an allocation which is better than the allocation X which is suggested by the system. So of course a course table allocation is individually rational because uh, uh, if you S put S to be a singleton uh, agent, then you never want a case that an agent can simply go away by using her own endowment and that is more preferred than what she actually got. So course table stability is a much stronger property and we will be after some way of allocating items which satisfies ideally core stability. And in fact, there is a well-known algorithm which is called uh, Gale's Top Trading Cycle Algorithm. It's one of the algorithms which is used as a building block for several nice allocation uh, algorithms across the world. It was also a central uh, part of a uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize given in economics in 2012 for matching algorithms. So it's a very simple algorithm, but it's a building block for many more complicated and richer algorithms used in matching markets and allocation algorithms. So it's a nice algorithm to have an understanding of. And the idea is again to think of uh, NV cycles. We already saw that uh, um, whenever you have an NV cycle you can implement exchanges and essentially this algorithm is essentially looking at an initial uh, allocation which is the endowment allocation. Each agent has her own allocation, her own item. Based on that situation, it may be the case that one agent thinks that she prefers another uh, agent's allocation, so she points at that agent. That person might think that she prefers somebody else's allocation, so she points at another agent. So you have a natural notion of NV graph which I've already defined. So this particular algorithm, it simply looks at the endowment allocation. Starting from the endowment allocation, it looks at the NV graph. If that NV graph has um, any cycle, it just implements the exchanges in that cycle and asks those agents to go away with their allocation. And it continues uh, with this approach. So uh, let's say you have two agents, agent one and agent two. Agent one owns O1, agent two owns O2. In that case, um, if agent one actually prefers agent two's uh, uh, item and agent two prefers agent one's item, then you have this idea that each agent points to its owner, each agent points to her most preferred item in the graph. Uh, if you have a cycle, you can Im implement exchanges in the graph and reallocate items. So in this case, agent one is going to be pointing at the, her most preferred item O2. Uh, O2 is always going to po point to her, the, a the agent who currently holds her or owns her. And O1 is going to point at agent one because it's currently owned by agent one. So it's slightly different from NV graph, but very similar. Yeah. So if you have a cycle, you can simply implement exchanges in the cycle, and this completes the allocation. All the items which were in the cycle are just uh, irrevocably given to the agent that points to that item in the cycle. So since agent one was pointing to agent two's item, she gets agent two's item, and agent two gets agent one's item, and we're done. There could be more complicated uh, settings where let's say you have five agents and different items. In this case, you have the case that agent one is going to point at uh, item two, agent two is going to point at item three, agent three is going to point at item four, and each item also points to its current owner. If there is a cycle, we simply identify such a cycle and 
irrevocably give the items to the uh, agents in the cycle. After that, um, we continue with this kind of formulation. In this case, there's a distributed cycle where agent five is pointing to agent uh, five's owned item. So we simply give agent five the item owned by agent five, and we are done. So this is uh, a nice algorithm. Uh, it's based on the idea that uh, you have these cycles. Um, if uh, nobody is pointing to another uh, Item. So first thing is that whenever you have this kind of formulation of an allocation, every agent is going to point at some item because every agent is going to point at the most preferred item in the graph. Every item is going to point at exactly one agent as well, which is going to be uh, the agent which currently holds or owns that particular item. So you always have an out degree of at least uh, exactly one, right? Because of that, you're guaranteed to have a cycle which is interesting because we are guaranteeing a cycle to actually implement exchanges. In the previous uh, problem, we were hoping that there would actually not be a cycle. So by guaranteeing a cycle exists, we implement exchanges in the cycle. When we implement exchanges in the cycle, we remove those agents and items from the cycle and the graph. And when you remove those items from the graph, then agents need to point to the most preferred item which is still present in the graph. So every time you have a cycle, you're guaranteed to have a cycle. And if you have a cycle, then you can easily implement exchanges in the cycle. Um, if the graph is empty, you're done. Otherwise, it's always the case that you get a smaller and smaller graph, each time guaranteeing a cycle. And each time when you guarantee a cycle, you can implement exchanges in the graph. So the algorithm is very simple. It's based on exchanges. Uh, but what is nice is that this algorithm satisfies all the nice properties which you could hope for uh, in the economics literature. Uh, it's, one main thing is that it's score stable, which is one property I defined. There are also other nice properties which uh, people in auction design and computer science and economics and game theory care about. One particular one is strategy proof, which is not a central property in uh, algorithms, but it's a very central property in economics is the idea that uh, agents should not have an incentive to misreport their preferences. So what is nice about this algorithm is that no agent has an incentive to misreport their preferences. They, they can simply report their preferences. And uh, the system which is going to solve a problem based on the expressed preferences of the agents is actually doing an optimization uh, on the real preferences. So no agent has an incentive to misreport their preferences, which is a nice economic property to have in any system design you have. Because if an agent may have an incentive to misreport their preferences, then you might be doing all kinds of computer science optimizations on the wrong input. So this is something to think about when you uh, think about allocation algorithms, auction design. So generally, algorithm design is much broader than solving graph problems. It can be applied to many different settings, and I gave you two different examples here where uh, graph type approaches can be used for finding desirable allocations in uh, the economics literature. So I'll stop at this point. Uh, I've given lots of references in the slides. If you're really interested in exploring some of these things a bit deeper, uh, feel free to explore these references. And I thank you for your attention, and hopefully Alex will be back next week. Thank you.